All right. Well, welcome everybody to Cafe Conversations. It is right at two o'clock, so we are going to go ahead and get started. Thank you guys for joining us. I'm Elizabeth Vaughn. I am the Associate Senior Director of Philanthropy for the college, and we're excited to be here today. Um, we, I have with me uh, Janet Mullins, Renee Fox, Jackie Walters, and Jean Nager, and we are going to talk about one of my absolute favorite things, food. These guys have put together uh, a cookbook, Cook Together, Eat Together, and so they're going to walk us through kind of the process of that, and we're even going to get to see a recipe demo. So I am very excited. Um, before we get started, just a reminder to everybody, we do keep everyone's microphones on mute just to allow us to hear our presenters a little bit better. But if you have a question during the presentation, feel free to use the chat function and we will answer all the questions at the end of the presentation. So without further ado, Janet, you wanna kick us off? I do. So I'm gonna share my screen with you all and tell you about this fun project. Um, I'll start by telling you a little bit about Family and Consumer Sciences Extension. You know, it's something that's uh, part of land grant universities and it's in all 50 states. And I noticed that we have people registered from all over the country for this. And that has been one great thing really about what we've learned about how to operate in 2020 is that um, we are able to provide our programming virtually in some cases, and really anybody in the country can access University of Kentucky Extension programming. Um, for example, we have got about 300 people from everywhere signed up for our Big Blue Book Club um, in July, which is gonna feature another cookbook by Chef Weta Michael. And so here on our Family and Consumer Sciences Extension web page, uh, which is a good place to start, you can find county offices in Kentucky and you can connect with us through Facebook and other social media platforms. We have a podcast called Talking Facts. And yes, I did take this screenshot on purpose with our cookbook cover there that says, UK Cooperative Extension Service dishes out cookbook jam-packed with recipes. So we would welcome you to uh, learn a little bit more about how to access Family and Consumer Sciences Extension. And now I'll tell you a little bit about this project, which has really been a labor of love and a, a fun project that we've been working on. Uh, we figured out while we were preparing this presentation that we've been working on this since about 2012. And so we're gonna tell you about a social marketing approach to promote healthy home-cooked family meals. And this project was undertaken by nutrition education programs in um, University of Kentucky Cooperative Extension Service. And that for us targets limited resource families and tries to help them through the FNEP program and our SNAP-Ed program. So Family and Consumer Sciences Extension partnered with my academic department, the Department of Dietetics and Human Nutrition, and we're all located in the College of Ag, Food, and Environment. And I hope you'll see that this has been a rather ideal project for the embracing the land-grant mission of research, teaching, and outreach. The first thing I want to do is tell you a little bit about social marketing. It involves the four P's, which are product, price, place, or placement, and promotion. The first thing that you want to notice is that it's all about influencing behaviors. And so the more you know about your audience and what motivates them to behave a certain way, the better you will be able to design a program that is helpful to them. I also want to note that social marketing is a process. It's not like a research project where you follow a protocol. It's actually very iterative. 
You just keep circling back and trying to improve things. And that's one of the reasons why it helps you to deliver value and why it is successful, why it helps people um, learn how to do things that are for the good of society. And so social marketing is taking the tools of marketing and putting them to use for the public good. If you contrast social marketing approach with a nutrition education approach, these are some of the differences that you might notice. Um, in nutrition education, we want people to learn. Sometimes we spend a lot of time trying to explain to people why they should do something. It's very expert-centered and kind of a medical model, where social marketing focuses on behavioral outcomes. How do you do this? You want to do this. It's consumer-centered, and it's more of a business model. So when we worked through the social marketing process for this project, way over on the left, we started the initial planning, as I mentioned, probably in about 2012. And we put together a team and then we submitted a proposal to the US Department of Agriculture and the Food and Nutrition Service. And um, we were funded to do the project. We did our formative or our market research. And that was actually the graduate project for a thesis for Jeannie Nager. And so there's a little bit of teaching that came in. Then we worked on our strategy formation to develop our four Ps. And I'll show you what those were. And then we use all of that information and very carefully listen to what the audience said to develop a program that meets their needs and honors what they value. Then you implement the program. We did two different pilot tests before we uh, implemented the program statewide and you just keep tracking and evaluating. And we completed this circle several times finally resulting in the publication of the cookbook in um, 2021 in the spring, so just earlier this year. So that's a little overview of the social marketing process. One of the things that we did for our formative research was to hold focus groups all around Kentucky. And we listened to people talk about what food meant to them, um, and these are some of the words, it's a word cloud that was developed from some of the words that we heard in those focus groups. And we tried to balance the counties that we went to, um, suburban, urban, rural, and um, all over the state geographically. So we tried to listen to Kentuckians from all over the Commonwealth. And here's what we learned by listening. We learned that they really valued preparing healthy home-cooked family meals, and we asked them, how would you like to learn to do that better, and exactly what would you like to learn? And so there's part of the information for our placement and our product. They told us that the things that they really valued were sharing meals and family time and that teaching children to become self-sustaining and how to cook and take care of themselves is a very strong motivator. A lot of the people that we talked to um, in limited resource families might not have been in the best health. And so one of the quotes that really stood out to me over the years has been, um, I want him to learn how to cook for himself because I may not be around to help him. And so that's a real motivator for a lot of families to share meal time and to teach their children how to cook and how to take care of themselves. Some of the barriers that we learned about were the price of healthy foods and how we can help stretch food purchases and diminishing resources to uh, be able to afford healthy meals for families. 
The dread of kitchen cleanup following a meal was also part of the price. Price in social marketing doesn't necessarily mean monetary price. It might mean the effort that it will take or um, embarrassment when it comes to exercising sometimes. And then finally, finding foods that everyone would like and eat is a part of our product. We specifically ask them about favorite foods and what kind of foods they'd like to learn to cook. What we learned about behaviors was that people were already mostly shopping at food stores and not eating away from home and really not spending a lot of time in the drive through for fast food. So most of these families were already cooking from scratch much of the week, but they could make healthier choices and finding foods that appealed to everybody in the family is something that was a challenge. Most were fairly skilled and they cook often, but they would be willing to adopt healthier methods. The stress of employment, commuting, family demand leaves less time for healthy cooking, but family time is a most treasured aspect of sharing meals and cooking together. We learned that um, some people might be afraid of having their children do things in the kitchen. And so part of our product is to help families see what children of different ages are able to safely do in the kitchen. Other behaviors that we identified during the formative work um, included behaviors about food shopping, cooking with children, and um, kitchen cleanup. So in order to be a success with a social marketing project, these are some of the things that you need to do. You need to be very careful when you're designing the work to know who your audience is and to segment out that audience. And so we knew that we were looking at limited resource families in Kentucky with young children. And we needed a deep understanding of that audience. So we do what we always did. Um, we listened to um, county extension agents, to program assistants in the nutrition education programs, and to the audience themselves through the focus groups. The next thing you need to be able to do is to target a specific behavior. I'm going to show you the cycle of cooking um, in a few minutes. And what we found was that Cooking is something that really requires a lot of thinking. And many people tend to do this throughout the day. Think about if right now, do you know what you could go in your kitchen and make? What's in your pantry? What's in your freezer? What would you need to pick up to make a meal? Then you need to carefully develop the strategies and the four Ps, pilot test, monitor, and then keep tweaking your product. And so those are the steps that we took to ensure a successful product over about the last decade. Here's our um, series of behaviors for the cooking process. What we learned when we started thinking about it was that um, some of the nutrition education program existing curriculum already taught people about how to plan meals, some tips on shopping, food safety, um, how to get children to eat vegetables and fruits, how to store leftovers, but maybe people could learn more about shopping, getting their food supplies into their house, how to store them so that they last a long time, prepare them, serve them, eat them and share a meal with their family, quick and easy stress-free cleanup, then storing the leftovers and starting all over. And so we, when we began to think about cooking as a process like this, it helped us really target very specific behaviors and include those in the product. So Family and Consumer Sciences operates within the Kentucky Cooperative Extension Service. And here you see one of our food and nutrition extension specialists, Courtney Luking, and her daughter, Sophia. And they are making, I believe, black bean burgers. Um, and so for our 
program, what we listened to our audience and learned was they wanted a series of cooking socials online or in person. And of course, during the pandemic, we developed an online approach. But before that, we held in-person programs. Some key program features were designed with the audience preferences, and you'll see those in our product. We designed um, grocery and farmer's market tours, and now we have those virtually, or that's something that the Extension Office can offer locally in person. And cooking with parents and ch children together was something that they wanted to do. Recipes and cooking skills that encouraged healthy home-cooked family meals. And so those are the things that we put into our product. And what we found was, lo and behold, fruit and vegetable consumption, um, as measured by uh, listening to what people ate in a 24-hour recall, increased by half a cup each per day with our intervention. And so cook together, eat together, helped families and children eat a whole cup of fruits and vegetables more every day. It's huge. This is the sort of thing my people get excited about. I know it might not seem like much, but when you look at the recommendation of five a day fruits and vegetables, this represents about 20% of that goal. And so now I'm going to turn it over to my colleague, Jackie Walters, who is one of my people and a registered dietitian, um, to talk about the book. And Jackie, I'll stop sharing if you want to start sharing and control your slides. Okay, I have sent the request. And I have approved it. Well, you know what happened? The um, PowerPoint disappeared and now I only have you. <laughs> yes, I was sharing my screen and I'm happy to do that again. I think you'd better because I did not pull it up okay. on my end. Here we go. Okay. You may have to advance slides. For me. Oh, yeah. Let's see. Um, so I get to take you on a little tour of the book. And the quote that you see up here, if you want to bring your family together, the kitchen is a good place to start, is the first sentence in the book. Um, as Janet spent some time telling you, Cook Together, Eat Together was created to leverage people's desire for family time and the desire to teach their children how to cook and be more um, self-sufficient and so we're leveraging that to get them to change the behavior and eat and cook and eat more healthy meals at home. Okay, next slide. Hmm. I am trying. I just want you to know. I am okay. trying. There it is. <laughs> <laughs> okay, this is our table of contents. And what you see basically is one chapter for the things that people told us they most wanted to learn how to cook. So uh, during, during focus groups when we were listening to the participants. The shopping part covers both um, smart shopping at the grocery store and smart shopping at the farmer's market. And each one of those sections covers meal planning, smart shopping strategies for each department of the store and reading nutrition facts labels and ingredient labels. All of the recipes that are included in the books were tested with our target audience. And one of the um, testings in, was conducted at a child care center with both parents and there were some children there. So we did get to see some of the children's and these are very small children's um, reactions to the foods and that was fun and informative for us. Okay, and then in the appendix, these are the sections that we have. We have um, put in the produce availability chart, which kind of helps people know when food will be most affordable and at its peak condition. So that's helpful for them to um, plan their meals. 
And then as Janet mentioned earlier, a lot of people don't have a feel for what is safe for children to do at any given age. So we've included youth-friendly tests arranged by age to give folks the idea um, of what's appropriate for each age. There is a guide to portion sizes, which you know helps with meal planning, how much should they buy, how many servings should they expect from a given amount of um, produce, product. There's a measurements and substitutions chart because if you don't cook often, you may not remember how many teaspoons are in a tablespoon or how many tablespoons are in a cup or what you can use if you don't have buttermilk. There is a whole section on knife skills um, you know, we found that the last two generations maybe have successively moved farther away from the land and they're eating fewer raw um, fruits and vegetables and other items. And so they don't know, you know, they're used to a bag of frozen vegetables or a can of vegetables or even salad in a bag. Um, they don't know the best knife to use or how to use it lots of times. So Jeannie has done some videos for us in that regard. Um, herbs and spices your way is a chart that just helps people figure out what, you know, what is rosemary good for? What does it go with? What does it complement? Um, there again, if you don't cook often and you're not cooking off of a, a recipe that tells you exactly how much of what to put in, you, you may not have a clue. And um, then some basic home cooking skills. So that covers things like, you know, how is a rolling boil different from a simmer? Okie dokie, next. So this is a sample of one page of one recipe. This is the Southern cornbread salad, which you are going to see in a little bit, and it is delicious. Um, on each page, you see a little square there that has several um, components, kid friendly, less mess, family time around the table, love those leftovers and nice price. And those all relate directly back to things that people told us were barriers to cooking family meals at home. Um, we give them an idea, you know, how to make this recipe kid friendly or what are some things that you could do um, just to enjoy your family around the table. How can you use leftovers again? Because um, we discovered that leftovers are valued and beloved. Um, people just aren't sure sometimes what to do with them. Um, and we gained so much wisdom and humor and insight from our study participants that we have included a quote with each recipe. So this one says, I think for me, I'm a Southerner. I learned all the wrong ways to make everything taste good, you know? So I think I just want to learn how to make things taste better the natural way so I could live a lot longer. And that really is kind of what the book's about, right? So with that being said, now, oh, look at that. Isn't that the cutest thing? Um, Renee and Jeannie are going to introduce the recipe in question and um, show you a, a video. Yeah, so this is Chef Nolan, who um, is helping us in the video that you're about to see. And so I'll invite Renee Fox, who is our Director of Communications and Marketing, and Jeannie Nager, who work now is graduated and finished her degree with our department and works with the nutrition education program to tell a little bit about it. Yeah, so we are going to make that cornbread salad recipe. So we just saw it come through in the comments. Someone has tasted it and said that they really enjoyed that. So Nolan was mm -hmm. our just wonderful little superstar chef. He mm -hmm. is three years old and um, he and his mom, um, who Heather is a an extension agent, uh, or she's with the dietetics and Department of Dietetics and Human Nutrition, and she does extension work for part of her job um, in addition to teaching. So um, they both were the wonderful um, chefs in this video. Mm -hmm. And yeah, last week they came over and we shot the video and Chef Nolan was eating everything and loving everything. So it's, it's good that he was uh, both hands on and enjoyed the dish. Yes. So um, <laughs> yeah, with that, we can, we can show you what we did together. Thank you. 
You are going to love this easy and delicious Southern cornbread salad recipe. It's a great one to make with young kids and they are more likely to be interested in foods they help prepare. Before we get started, we're going to wash our hands thoroughly with soap and warm water. We baked our cornbread according to the package directions earlier and now it's ready to remove from the oven. We'll let it stand until cool. Now that our cornbread has cooled, we'll cut it into one inch cubes. Using a kid-friendly knife and cutting board designed for children, my son is going to help me. Because his knife isn't sharp, cutting a soft ingredient like cornbread is a great way for him to safely learn cooking skills. Mixing is a great step for young children and one of my son's favorite kitchen tasks. I'm going to help him measure the ingredients and let him add them into the bowl and mix. In a medium bowl, we're adding one cup plain Greek or regular yogurt, two teaspoons low-fat mayonnaise, two teaspoons all-purpose seasoning, two teaspoons dried dill weed, two teaspoons ground black pepper, half a teaspoon garlic powder, and half a teaspoon of salt. Once we have mixed this together, we're going to set it aside and assemble our salad. This recipe for ranch dressing is cheaper than store-bought brands and is much healthier. If you have leftover dressing or want to double the recipe, leftovers are great for a veggie dip. Assembling the layers of this salad is another easy step for young children. We prepped our ingredients before we got started, so now we're going to add it all together to create a layered salad that is a meal in a bowl. We'll start with a layer of cornbread. Using leftover cornbread is a time saver and a great way to love those leftovers. Next, we're going to add one 15 ounce can of light kidney beans that we have drained and rinsed. Our next layer is three cups of frozen yellow sweet corn that we have thawed. You can also use three 15 ounce cans of no salt added whole kernel corn drained and rinsed. The following layer is one small red onion that I have chopped. After that, we're adding one chopped bell pepper. I also chopped two large tomatoes that are our next layer. I cooked and crumbled three slices of bacon that are going on top of the tomatoes. Now it's time to create a layer with the salad dressing we made earlier. Next, we're adding one and a half cups of shredded cheddar cheese. We're finishing our dish off by topping it with chopped green onions. The flavors and colors complement each other perfectly to make a dish that is beautiful and delicious. This healthier version of a cornbread salad and ranch dressing could make your family's favorite list. We hope you enjoy this just as much as we do. We hope you enjoyed that. And uh, so the cornbread salad came from, uh, I think we mentioned earlier that in our focus groups, we asked what their favorite food, what some of their favorite foods were. And we got a lot of um, meals that were traditions, you know, family traditions that they grew up eating. And cornbread salad was mentioned quite a bit. And so um, we, you know, we put our own spin on it to add a lot more vegetables and some, some beans in there and just um, make it in a way where you could enjoy it. And it's, but it has a little bit more, uh, more nutrition maybe than, than prior. So uh, Renee and I were going to talk about some other ways that you could use it. Um, you could even put them in little mason jars and kind of layer it so that it's an easy lunch on the go. Or if you were having people over and wanted to serve it, um, everybody can get their own little individual mason jar. Um, and yeah, there, it's just such a filling, um, hearty salad that can keep in the refrigerator and it doesn't get soggy because there's not a bunch of lettuce and stuff. So um, we hope that if you do have the cookbook at home, um, you can enjoy it on your own. Yeah, so we've done this at um, large group events where we've had some trainings and really introduced this product. And um, as Jeannie said, with the build your own, it's just kind of setting up almost like a, a buffet line and everyone just kind of builds it in. And so you, it's a really great dish to feed a really large crowd. Mm -hmm. um, again, with the, how Janet mentioned earlier with the love your leftovers, it kind of, this is a great way to use leftover cornbread. Um, and as you saw, our little three-year-old was doing a great job of cutting and, um, 
um, just great, great way for him to practice those knife skills. And um, it, it was just a crowd favorite. I mean, he was really a testament of, um, you know, the fact that when you engage kids in the cooking process, they really are more likely to eat things. And as you saw him eating at the end, he also behind the scenes in the kitchen did a lot of snacking along the way. So it was really cute. So as he was building layers, he took a little pause and um, sampled all of those layers, even the red onion he enjoyed um, by the mouthful. So it was just adorable and just such a great way really to introduce kids to new ingredients that they might not have had before. So all of the recipes in the book are just really kid-friendly and you know, all, as we talked about earlier, like there are little steps that kind of talk about what's appropriate for different ages and just kind of gives you tips to um, engage your child in this, but it's lots of great recipes. And I think they did a really nice job with the, the cover design of the book and just showing the, um, you know, kind of kid-friendly aspect of that as well. Thanks you all. I wanna apologize you all for having my chat box in the middle of the video. Sorry about that. When we follow up, we will send you a copy of the cornbread salad recipe, oh, good. a link to the YouTube video so that you may watch it without my chat box in the middle of it, and uh, <laughs> some information about where to buy the book. Um, a link to University Press of Kentucky is the publisher, and we have been so pleased to be able to work with them. And also on the link for the YouTube channel that you'll receive with the video, um, we produced several other videos doing some of the other demonstrations for some of the recipes and Mindy McCauley did a great job of putting those together on the um, FCS extension um, YouTube page. And so there's a, their own channel. So as you watch Nolan again, continue and watch some others as well. Now we're going to give away a cookbook that will be mailed to one of our participants. And so, Renee, I'll turn it over to you to make the magic happen. So we are prepared to do this after the next segment. Um, oh, I'm sorry. Okay. So... Here is, I'm just going to talk a little bit um, about student opportunities, and then I'll turn it back over to you. Perfect. And we're also going to be happy to um, take any questions, and there may be some in the chat box. Uh, so... We want you to um, send us your future wildcats. We, uh, in our Department of Dietetics and Human Nutrition, we offer undergraduate degrees, graduate degree in nutrition and food systems, a master's degree. And then we have several certificates, um, hunger and food systems and um, human performance and nutrition. So if you know a young person that would be interested in coming to University of Kentucky, just like many of you did, and um, they like food and nutrition or enjoy cooking, um, this is uh, something that we would love for you to do. They can, um, anybody who's interested can come here to our webpage, which is on the College of Ag webpage under Dietetics and Human Nutrition, and there's a virtual tour thanks to Renee, that's posted on the website. And you'll also be able to learn a lot about the opportunities that we have for students to be involved and um, to be a part of our department, the College of Ag, Food and Environment, and the University of Kentucky in a very meaningful way throughout their college education. And so we just wanna encourage you to send us your future Wildcats those are um, the things that we can help them do. And they, who knows, they might want a career in extension. We have an awful lot of fun. Okay, Renee and Jeannie, are you ready for the giveaway? We are ready. I'm gonna do a little drum roll. <laughs> okay. 
So we, did a, we did a little generator and um, Mary Snow was the winner. See, Mary is with us today. Oh, she says, yippee. yippee. Good. Yay. <laughs> So Mary, we have your address and we're going to be mailing um, a copy to you. Great. Congratulations, Mary. We hope you enjoy. Um, so Beth, we're going to turn it back over to you to MC some questions and wrap us up. Yeah, absolutely. Well, thank you all so much. I have to say just on that cornbread salad recipe alone, I am getting this book. I mean, it looks awesome. I don't even have kids and I'm excited about the book. Uh, so we have a couple questions that were submitted um, in advance, and one of them, I think it, I was not this child, but my sister was this child, the very picky eater. So someone has suggested they've tried everything. They read the book, French children need everything. They've tried everything under the sun to get their kids to try new foods and just had no luck. Do you all have any Suggestions, tips, are there tips in the book of, you know, how to get kids to try new foods? So I'll start and then I'll invite my colleagues to jump in with their ideas. We know that um, when kids help grow something like a carrot or tomato, it is amazing how much more they want to try it. And so getting them involved in growing a food and as was mentioned in the recipe demo, getting them involved in preparing foods, it really does make them want to taste it and to try it. I will also say that the research shows that a child may have to try or taste something 10 or 15 times before they accept it. And so it really takes a lot of patience and it also takes modeling, you know, other people. Like if dad doesn't eat that, maybe I don't want to eat it. So it's helpful if other people model the behavior. Mm -hmm. That is great advice. Kind of along that spectrum, and you guys talked about this a little bit with in particular that recipe, you know, a lot of us grew up learning, particularly kind of those Southern staple recipes that, you know, are things like fried and, you know, very, maybe not the healthiest words associated with those and, you know, really high carbohydrate, high fat diets that just sort of are those traditional foods. You know, what do you guys recommend? I guess, you know, you talked a little bit about tweaking that recipe you know, are there other things, other ways to get, you know, our family members on board with moving away from those maybe traditional foods into a slightly more healthier version of that food or just a healthier recipe in general? Jeannie, would you want okay, to take I can, I can start off with this one if you want. <laughs> so um, I think one of the key things is to start small, you know, don't just radically change your entire diet and say, I'm never allowed to eat fried chicken again, or whatever it is, or even cornbread salad. If you think cornbread salad wasn't the best, the way your family makes it, you know, you can still incorporate these foods in your lives and your life. And you can um, just, if you, you can modify it to maybe add some more vegetables or, you know, put your own spin on it. But if you can't modify that exact dish, then think about what you're eating with it. And, um, you know, you don't want to deprive yourself. You still want it because we, we all associate so many great memories with, um, with some of our favorite foods and everything. And you still want to bring yourself that joy, but maybe you, um, change up the side dishes or, um, even what you're drinking with it, things like that, that you can just kind of, um, still get those vitamins and nutrients in there while enjoying the foods that you love. But, um, aside from some of our favorite foods, if you're just looking to make diet changes, just starting small. If you if you get too radical, it can be too overwhelming. And then we think, oh, this doesn't work. I can't do this. This is just too much. So um, maybe just start with, I'm going to make sure I eat vegetables with every single meal, like start there or look at the my plate and say, I'm going to try to make all of my meals um, similar to the my plate meal where I include um, something from each food group, something like that, where you can uh, just it's more realistic for you to carry that with you and make a, make it a habit uh, that, you know, stays with you for a lifetime instead of just for, for a moment. <laughs> mm -hmm. 
And I noticed that um, Mary Snow has said lots of exposure and lots of time with kids. Boy, it does. Patience. Just a, it's just a part of dinner. And then um, I noticed that Mindy McCauley put in a couple of helpful links in there to some of our talking facts about um, planning meals and getting out of the rut and then also uh, picky eaters and kids. And so there's a couple of resources in there and we'll also drop those in the follow-up email where we send the other information to you all. And thanks for the cheering, Dimitri, on um, the extension service. We think it rocks too. <laughs> Another example of how we kind of tried to address some of this in the project was we had one comment that stuck out in my mind from a participant who said that um, when we could make it taste as good as a French fry, <laughs> eat the other vegetable. So one of the things, one of the recipes that's included is um, crispy oven zucchini fries, which, you know, so a lot of what we did was try, and we also had um, instructions and recipes for roasted vegetables. So a lot of what we did was kind of trying to help people get some of those same flavors and textures without, um, you know, the same old deep frying kinds of maybe cooking methods. Yeah, that is all fantastic advice. Uh, we had someone ask about how long it took to develop the book, which Janet, I think you addressed, it was about 10 years in the making through the whole process. Maybe not necessarily just focused on the book, but kind of all the research and all the background work that went into it. And so since you've already made one book, the next question is, is there gonna be a sequel to this book or any supplemental website or videos or anything this person said they've actually already gotten two copies for their two nieces who are new mothers and they are really enjoying it with their family. So any follow-ups planned on the book? Well, um, I think that we would certainly be open to doing other books. We're in kind of a wait and see mode. You know, we're going to see how this one sells, <laughs> <laughs> just like any other new author. Um, and so, uh, Jennifer Hunter, who is the director of our Family and Consumer Sciences Extension Programs, has helped us navigate this publishing process because that's not something university faculty members usually do. And so we needed some help. Um, and really working with University Press of Kentucky has been quite easy. It took just a few months, really. Um, and so we would think about um, perhaps doing another book. And there are a lot of resources. And in fact, many county extension offices have offered Cook Together, Eat Together as a virtual series, like maybe through a Facebook Live platform. And so there's a lot of other opportunities, um, you know, to see the recipe demonstrations like through the YouTube videos. And we will be, somebody has asked if we're planning on bringing them to the National Extension Association of Family and Consumer Sciences. And Mary, we hadn't thought about that, but maybe we will. I noticed that it's going to be in Grand Rapids, Michigan this year, and it will be in person um, as people come out. We would also probably think about going to Kentucky Extension Homemakers. And I think University Press of Kentucky is going to take it maybe to Kentucky Crafted, the Market, and the Kentucky Authors Forum. So those are some other things. Just look for us in the news, in your area or online. Um, and we'll, we will be offering more things. Yeah, that's fantastic. And I know I also posted in the chat the FCS website and the dietetics website. Thank so you. if anybody wants to take a look at those, um, I think you can get to the book actually from both of those. So, um, so you guys talked about adding more fresh fruits and vegetables into recipes. And, you know, obviously a big part of the book is also making things that are a little bit budget friendly. And we all know fresh fruits and veggies can add up quickly, you know, when we're out buying those in the grocery store. And so do you have tips kind of to stretch that dollar of how should we store some of those? Do you have, is it, 
maybe it's too complicated because it varies by <laughs> fruit or vegetable, but if you have any tips, I think people would love to hear those. Does anybody want to take a stab at this one? Well, I know on um, we have plenty of extension resources that can show you by, you know, each each produce item, how exactly you can store it. And on Plan Eat Move, um, the NEP website, and then uh, Plated Up Kentucky Proud has plenty of resources if you want to know how to store each exact um, uh, piece of produce. But, you know, speaking of, of affordable ways to incorporate fruits and vegetables, it doesn't always have to be fresh. You know, here in Kentucky, we have great produce from the farmer's markets and all these things that it's great to enjoy. But, um, you know, if you... It, in the off season or something, uh, frozen vegetables and canned vegetables are just as nutritious and there's no need to steer away from those. And uh, as we all know, they're much more, have, have much, a much longer shelf life and they're just as nutritious. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's fantastic. I'm glad that, I'm glad that you mentioned Plan Eat Move, um, Jeannie, because any really has tried to take what we learned from this social marketing project and apply it across the board. Um, there are a lot of resources on Plan Eat Move. There are recipes, um, there are videos for preparation, not only for recipes, but even um, Jeannie has done a lot of how-to kinds of things about um, you know, how to peel a various piece of fruit or you know, pair a certain vegetable. Um, and I, th I think that anybody could find resources that they could use, including a map of farmers markets. Yeah. yeah, that sounds like a great resource. So if anybody has any last questions, go ahead and submit those to the chat. But the last one that I have received is, what's your all's favorite recipe from the book? <laughs> That's a tough question. I think <laughs> I like the cornbread salad. <laughs> That's why we keep making it. <laughs> Demonstrations. The corn uh, would, would, Oh, go ahead. I was just going to say, I would say, I think vegetable soup recipe is maybe the best vegetable soup I know of. It's really good. I really like how versatile the sunrise granola is. I, I, mm. I don't even think I need the recipe anymore, which is part of what Cook Together, Eat Together is supposed to do to the point where you can learn some basic skills and not even need to use a recipe anymore. Um, but yeah, it's, I've made it a ton of different ways and you can just pretty much add whatever you want to it and it'll come out as a good, nice hearty granola. <laughs> and the chicken and dumpling soup is really good. Mm -hmm. It has kale in it. And we did another recipe video on that and just seeing some of the kids make the little dumplings and drop them in, um, they just had a blast with that. So I think it's another great one for making as, together as a family. Well, you guys have made me hungry listening to all of this. So I appreciate everybody joining us today. This is our last installment of Cafe Conversations as we transition back to more in-person activities. We're kind of moving away from these and focusing a little bit more on that. But that's not to say that there are not great resources out there, as you've heard throughout this presentation. Check out Extension, your local Extension office, through the college's website, there are resources on everything from how to grow your vegetables, obviously how to cook and prepare them, you know, tips and tricks um, all across the board. So I encourage you all to visit that. I'll also say make sure you visit just the General College website to stay up to date on events we're having. So that's ca.uky.edu. So ca.uky.edu. Check that out. Check out the Alumni Association. We're having tons of great events this summer and fall all around the state here on campus. October 2nd is our big event, which is Roundup. So I hope everybody will be able to be there and join us in person. It feels very weird, but very exciting to say those words. Looking forward to it. And thank you all for presenting. And I can't wait to get my copy of the book and get started cooking. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you.